Imagine you're a patriot for the cause of American independence. But in the days before planes, trains, and automobiles, you just can't make it to Philadelphia to mark down your John Hancock next to John Hancock. What do you do? Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old towns of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline On the east side, west side Things ain't like before There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys Oh, New York ain't New York anymore Hello, history lovers, and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. In this episode, our time machine is going to travel back to the American Revolution, where we'll meet Nathaniel Martin, a young post rider tasked with the biggest job of the Revolution. He's going to have to gather signatures for the Declaration of Independence. Our guide on this fictional journey is Karen A. Chase, who brings us Carrying Independence, a founding documents novel. The book has already garnered accolades, securing second place in the William Faulkner, William Wisdom unpublished novel competition, and it rolled its way into the semis at the Screencraft Cinematic Book Competition. Karen's first effort, Bonjour 40, a Paris travelogue, also met with critical acclaim, earning her seven independent publishing awards. You can visit our guest at KarenAChase.com or find her on social media at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Today she lives in historic Richmond, Virginia, but Karen Chase traveled a long way. She was born and raised in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, but has a couple of ancestors who fought in the War of Independence, which gained her membership in the National Society of the Daughters of the American Revolution. Yes, the D.A.R. Those of you who are Gilmore Girl fans will be familiar with the Gilmores being in the D.A.R. My wife, as a Canadian like Karen, but also a genealogist, spends a lot of time digging into people's revolutionary roots so that they can join either the sons or daughters of the American Revolution, because it's really a feather in your cap. Okay, now that we've saddled up our horses... Let's join Karen A. Chase and meet Nathaniel Martin, a young patriot charged with the solemn duty of carrying independence. I'm joined via Skype by Karen A. Chase, author of Carrying Independence, a founding documents novel. Thank you so much for making time to chat with the History Author Show, Karen. Thank you, Dean. I'm so excited to be here. (laughs) Well, I think we connected over Twitter originally. You sent me a very nice direct message and you've tweeted to me. I'd love to see people that are active out there with history as I am myself. And you said, gosh, I I listen and I would love to be on. And what a great compliment that is. (laughs) And then there's always a little trepidation, right? You say, boy, this person is so nice. What if I get the book and I don't like it? What am am I going to do, right? You're trapped. And fortunately, that was very much not the case with with Carrying Independence. I picked it up and I said, what a great idea. It's a unique novel. It fills a hole that stands alone on the shelves where you can get it. But that doesn't make for an easy sell to a publisher or an easy pitch to an agent. They like to cram books into a specific category, and they demand authors fit those molds, too. They say, well, I don't know if you're right for this because you're too young or too old. You're a woman or you're a man. How do I sell this? How do I market it? You call your novel factual fiction, which is not one of the typical categories you would hear, even though it seems to me very self-evident as someone who loves books. I I know them, what I'm going to get picking up carrying independence, but I'm not on the marketing side. I can't argue. 
what does that factual fiction mean to somebody who's listening now, who's thinking about the Declaration of Independence here in the U.S., and who's in the market for their next great summer read? What are they going to get when they pick up your book? Sure. Well, first, I have to compliment you on your use of the phrase self-evident, like straight out of the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> you caught that, huh? Yeah, I, I did. <laughs> A little bit top of mind these days, but um, the book is historical fiction. It does fall into the historical fiction category, which is often broad and encompasses historical biographies and historical romance, which this is neither of those. But it also is military fiction because I take readers into the trenches of some of those infamous moments like the Battle of Brooklyn, but it's also not a novel about war. The reason I'm describing it as factual fiction is basically I'm a consummate student dean. So I've enjoyed books that set out in chronological order what happened, and then they weave the fictional characters into that history as both influencers of it and being affected by it. So kind of like Michael J. Fox's character in Back to the Future. The history of his life is set out, but he goes back and influences it, and it changes him as well. But I liked it in the context of history. It's better for me than stories that are simply plunked into an era with a few period details to make you feel like you're in the time period. I really wanted that education that comes with it of learning about what happened between July of 76 and March of 1777, but with real events, real people, and the opportunity for readers to see themselves in those characters. And so many challenges with that when you are a lifetime student, you can go down that rabbit hole of research and before you ever put down a pen to paper, or in this case, you probably write in a computer, but this is just how it works. You go and you have to say, okay, I'm not going to show all my research. I'm going to write a book that is a ride. When you're talking about carrying independence, somebody on horseback, this post rider that you invent, you can't have him just hanging around, which is a temptation. Right. You always want to throw in this patriot, that patriot. You say, gosh, there was this tavern like the old 76 house in Japan, New York, that I went there. I interviewed the tavern keeper, and Washington was there. It's where they kept the man that conspired with Benedict Arnold to betray West Point. And Alexander Hamilton was sleeping upstairs at the time. All these major people were there. So if I was writing Carrying Independence, I would say, well, I got to I gotta somehow get myself to the old 76 house. I got to sit there and have a beer with Washington. And I, I have to, I'd like to be there right when Hamilton was. And now, before you know it, like a real bar, oh, I've lost track of the time and the word count. And <laughs> you, you can't do that, right? You're not, you're not really time traveling. You're just indulging a little bit of that in yourself and trying to tell a story. So how do you meet that challenge of going exactly where the story takes you, not necessarily going everywhere you might want to go as the student of history you are? Right. I really let the events of that first eight months, essentially, July of 1776 onward, dictate what happens in many ways. Obviously, my main characters in the book are all fictional, so it's very hard to force them to do well, I guess I am kind of a puppeteer. I do kind of force them to do certain things inside of that time frame. But I wanted to write a book in which my intent was to recreate realities of 1776. And that means not moving historical dates around, but instead letting them drive the plot itself. It's constant vigilance. I, I worked with a, an editor early on who said you have to remember that writing historical fiction is like an iceberg. You research 100%, but you show everybody 10%. And I wanted to show everybody about 20, <laughs> which, <laughs> which meant learning more than probably necessary, but really sticking to that history and letting the facts and the primary sources and the outcomes of each event really dictate how my characters were then influenced and influencing the history. I mentioned about how you identify with the character and people wanting to see you, for instance, if you're a woman writing about women, DC Fontana maybe is the most famous example in Star Trek. She didn't go by her name Dorothy because she didn't think that young boys would want to read a story written by a woman. So she went by DC and wrote some of the classic Star Trek episodes and some of the novel adaptations. 
Your protagonist here, Nathaniel Martin, is a post rider, which I assume is not a job you ever had in summer. So that's that's already two things separated from you when you say you're going to get in that guy's head and learn about it, which is what a good novelist does. Right. What's that job? And where did you get your inspiration for his character? Where did that research you were talking about take you? And you said, I'm going to figure out what it was like to be a post rider during the American Revolution. Right. Early on, I had a gentleman in my neighborhood ask me if I was writing this from a women's perspective. And I told him, well, of course I am, because I am a woman and I'm writing it. Mm -hmm. So to me, that made sense that then it became about the human experience. And regardless of whether or not I've been an 18th century revolutionary soldier, or I was a founding father, my perspective was often what is the human experience here? What are the challenges both emotionally and physically and decision wise that people are going through at this time. But like you said, there's sometimes you run across evidence in the, the history and the facts that you're researching that says, you know, I really would love for Nathaniel Martin to be a post writer. He's carrying this declaration across the colonies to men who were not at the formal signing. He is fictional. There's no proof that, he or anyone carried it to the signers who could not attend the formal signing on August 2nd. Even the National Archives said it most likely stayed with the Congress, and a term like most likely leaves it open to projection. So because we didn't know how that was done, it left a lovely hole for me to fill with a guy like Nathaniel. But when it comes time to have a man hired by Congress to carry a document, with the skill set that someone like that would need? So some of my decision of making him a post writer was really practical. I needed a skill set for a character that would propel the narrative, you know, kind of like Luke Skywalker in Star Wars. He knew how to fix and repair droids, which then allows him to find the message from Leah. It's not really the skill set that he's going to learn as the story goes on. It's something that we need of Nathaniel. We need him to understand what delivering messages is like, what the post roads are, how to follow game trails. Those were necessary skills for a man who was delivering a letter and therefore would be necessary for someone delivering something as important as a declaration. When you said that about being a woman, I thought of Margaret Thatcher. They would ask her what it's like being a woman prime minister. And she'd say, I have no idea. I've never experienced the alternative. (laughs) (laughs) She's going to be the prime minister and you're just going to be a writer. And that's not as if you sit there and say, I don't think there's a good or bad way, depending on your gender, to write a good novel. You write a good story. You find this great idea. I mean, I am certainly thrilled that when you do find this hole in the historical record about the Declaration of Independence, you didn't say to yourself, well, I, I can't really write that. I'm glad you did, because yeah. what a great one. This is something people can't just go out and pick up a history book and will have heard a million times. And it, it seems so obvious that somebody would have picked it up before. How did those signatures get on there of the people that weren't right in Philadelphia at the time? Right. It seems obvious now in some respects. But, you know, I, as I describe kind of toward the end of the book, The document itself was really, as I say, obscured by the urgency and the ever-growing history of war. So even the historians all these years later and through the last 240-some years, they have tended to focus on the battles and on the, the fight that won us our independence instead of on the document because it was very quickly eclipsed with that urgency of war. Now, I have to say, you said our... So now this is a period that happened with my wife when she moved here from Canada. You you start identifying with us. So well, I, <laughs> start identifying with the U.S., huh? Well, I do in part because I'm only a couple generations removed. Right. Three out of four grandparents were American, and I have ancestors who fought and supported the revolution. So I am a daughter of the American Revolution, and consequently, it does feel like our I have to say for myself, I am part of a North American union, I feel like, having a Canadian spouse. Mm -hmm. So something that you did was you traveled all over. You traveled, what was it, 46 of the 48 contiguous U.S. states. You traveled to a bunch of the Canadian provinces. Also, I remember reading in your bio, you're not taking that in revolutionary times, but there are probably some moments there where you can identify with somebody taking a long trip On any trip, it's not going to be like a buddy movie. There's always a lot of downtime. 
were there any things in there where you said because you'd done all this traveling yourself and you'd gotten an idea of what a long trip and wanting to get to the end involves that it influenced you when you're writing here about Nathaniel's journey and the times when he's going to have challenges along the way, but he still has this duty to do and a goal to reach. Sure. I mean, absolutely. The trips that I made in the RV with my family nearly every summer from the time I was about seven until I was about 17, we were gone for eight to 10 weeks at a time. Hmm. I think a little bit unlike Nathaniel in that he really wants to wrap this thing up and be done with carrying the signatures. My brother and I never wanted to go back home. <laughs> for us on that road, on those road trips, it was all about history and education and books. And my parents really, by their actions, showed my brother and me how every mile and every minute in life is an opportunity to learn. So they took us to museums and battlefields and every used bookstore in between on those trips. And that education for me as a kid was really freeing. The school and the classroom and being at home, that's where I felt trapped. So those eight to 10 weeks were nothing but freedom and adventure for me. And books, which for a little bookish Karen when she was younger was like hours and hours of opportunities to read without interruption as we were driving. And so that feeling, that freedom that the road brought me is the thing that I kept coming back to with Nathaniel. He's the second son of a German gunsmith who is feeling like his only choice is to stay in the gun shop. But for him, being on the road is freedom. And so taking on the task of carrying the declaration. Yes, he wants it completed. And yes, he wants it done because of some of the other objectives that he is trying to fulfill. But it's that being on the road. It's why he accepts the job of being a post writer to begin with, because it's such a delightful experience for him to be out in the world that makes sense to him. As an aside, you can tell when a novelist really has a handle on the character when you talk about them like they're real people. (laughs) If someone was just overhearing us talk, they wouldn't have known you're not talking about a real person that you know very well, which you have to get to know them very well if you're going to write a novel about them. We joke in our house that he sits around in the living room and all the times that I was (laughs) querying agents or getting the book ready to go out, he would be like strumming his fingers on the desk waiting for me to finish. And I mean, I know he doesn't exist, but we we talk about him like he does too, (laughs) all of them. All of the characters in the book. Yeah, you don't want to end up, it uh, sounds like a Stephen King novel. He has a few like that, that the, the, you know, the somehow the person he's writing about comes to life. So that's not going to happen here. <laughs> I did like the idea of the touring, the declaration of bringing the country, much like George Washington does after independence, taking the federal government to these 13 very different, very separate states. I knew the Declaration of Independence, for instance, was taken on a tour after signing. It was brought to a church in New Brunswick, New Jersey. It's still there. You can see the historic plaque. I used to always point it out when I went to Rutgers University as someone who loved history, but was overworking with the horses usually because I was studying animal science. (laughs) They read it aloud there for just the third time. And it's thrilling for me to stand on that spot and, and always have thought of that, of Here is something very new in history that's being brought out to life, being brought out to people who maybe are still wondering just what it means. Your story follows the man who's gathering those signatures, and it's probably easy to forget just what a signature meant in those days, what pledging your life, your sacred honor, your fortune, everything about you, because If they don't, as Benjamin Franklin said, if we don't hang together, we'll all certainly hang separately. So it was really something to get someone to put their name right down on that piece of paper and commit to that. This wasn't just they were all going to sign a petition and if things didn't work out for the new community center in town that they would just go on with their lives. It was a real risk. They put everything into it. So what did it feel like to try to get each different person with a different attitude and explain to the reader, without having the exposition be really obvious, what each of those people thought. Because you couldn't have them go to every house, just get the signature and move on. How did you plan how each of those different people would react to his request? Yeah, so uh, the obvious part is the fact that there were primary sources. I mean, there's a lot of letters from the founding fathers that kind of indicated to me where they were. So geographically, I could plot out where my characters needed to go in terms of the secondary characters, but also in terms of Nathaniel, in which order was he going to collect signatures across which colonies. And then those same letters, for instance, really gave me 
insight into the men. And I made a decision very early on that I would try and not include too many of the ones that we already know about. I would let obviously the history dictate to me which men were not at the formal signing. And then I would immediately not put them on a pedestal and try to look at them as if I were meeting them for the first time. And in an example like Oliver Wolcott from Connecticut, you know, going up there, I traveled to all the places that I feature in the book, and we went up to Litchfield, Connecticut. I would have loved to have seen in his home, but it's still a privately owned home. But we ended up going to the library, and the local library had collected all of Oliver Wolcott's letters that he had written home to his wife, and they had transcribed them into these books of his letters in chronological order. And so I read them as if I was Oliver Wolcott's wife. What was he telling me about what his experiences were like on the road away from home? And then the dates of those letters actually let me see when it was that he was away and when he was he was home. So in trying to get Nathaniel to go to his home, for instance, up in Litchfield, which I wanted to do, I wanted people to experience what the 13 colonies, or at least the seven I could feature, looked like at the time, to put him there at Oliver Wolcott's home. And then the dialogue and the verbiage and the way Oliver Wolcott speaks comes right from those letters. I use phrases that he used, hmm. endearments that he used. Some people talk about letting historical figures channel through them, and I just let them speak for themselves. And I just I found out what they were about and tried not to make them into these grand ideal men instead. I tried to show them flawed and human and suffering with worry about what shape we were in and what it was personally going to do to each of them. You mentioned dialogue, letting them speak for themselves. That's something that is also really a skill and something you have to hit just right because you want to give just enough slang and jargon to have a flavor for that error. But you have 21st century readers and we're not going to stick around for a lot of V's that are in the place of U's, right? And we don't want to read that in print and we don't want to have a lot of these and nows and probably a lot of the really time consuming things like presenting themselves to somebody new. We would get bored with that. Anybody would reading a novel. You you need to keep that pace up always. He's on a mission here. He's not just wandering around <laughs> on a tour. So what sources did you tap? You mentioned those letters. And then what did you decide was the right 10% that you said that editor gave you to make for your book to put into somebody's mouth and have a flavor for the time and the way people spoke and acted, but not overwhelm people with that fatal sin of a novel showing your research? Right. So early on when I was doing some of the research, I had lunch with Woody Holton. He writes a lot of nonfiction in this time period and academically in this time period. And when I told him I was writing fiction, he said, oh, my gosh, you're not going to make them talk like they did back then, are you? <laughs> and I said, no, I actually want to make it so that people today can read it and feel like they're connecting with those characters. But there are some words and phrases that are very common to the time period, and you can explain them inside of inside of a sentence, or sometimes it's just throwing in the way that a sentence is formed. I remember, I think it's the movie True Grit. They don't use any contractions whatsoever. And for the first three or four minutes of the film, you're very thrown by that. And then you start to get into the cadence of the speaking and things that the characters are doing. So there is a little bit of that in this, but it really is just, again, trying to go back to that basic human experience. And when you're trying to have a character convey a thought to another character, how do you do that and make it feel like you're still in 1776? And a lot of the time and placement and geography does. And those primary documents, again, you know, Oliver Wolcott, who I mentioned earlier, he speaks about God quite a bit, whereas someone like George Wythe is going to really talk about the academics and the history behind something. And so using those aspects of those particular people, even Esther DeBert Reed, she's a woman who's featured in the book, looking at her writing, she had a tremendous number of letters that posthumously were published. And so I could really gauge how it was that she conveyed what she was thinking about and worrying about to those family members because of those letters. And I think that helped a lot. But aside from that, if you can't tell yet, I'm also a big movie buff. And so I like hmm. actors and favorite characters from books and from movies 
that I have loved over the years are very much in this book. So I look at a relationship between brothers, for instance, Nathaniel and his brother Peter are very much at odds in the way that they conduct their lives and what they both want. And, you know, the legends of the fall, the the relationship between Tristan and Sam in that movie, the relationship between those two brothers to me is really something that influenced the relationship between Nathaniel and Peter in this, or Arthur is Nathaniel's devoted friend. And I look at characters like Samwise in Lord of the Rings, who seems to have a handle on life almost better than Frodo does. Because Samwise is calmer and more approachable, but also out for other things, it balances what's going on with Frodo. And it's the same thing between Arthur and Nathaniel. So I look at some of those favorite characters, even um, with Susanna. In my book, Susanna is one of the female characters that we follow throughout the whole book. And I am a big Jane Austen fan, and there was nothing better in a Jane Austen book than a twittering mother trying to marry off her daughter. And so you really see that again with her. So it's kind of a little homage to my favorite Jane Austen as well. And it's also got to be a challenge that people who are going to read this target audience are going to want to see that in there or are going to be picking at things like anachronisms. I know I do that when I read The Gilded Age, which I'm very familiar with. It's an area of focus for me. So I'll notice something. If someone has a zipper, you better not have a zipper on your pants, right, in 1899 because there's no zippers yet. You better not be wearing a wristwatch. But same thing for the language. And not only is the language tough, but sometimes they will use words that strike a reader in modern times as so off. When I spoke with Crystal King about her novel set in ancient Rome, Feast of Sorrow, she said she wanted to give one of the female characters the name Melissa. Everyone said that sounds so modern. You can't have that. Mm -hmm. And she said, but that was a name. And in ancient Greece, they use that's honey. That's some, it's a wonderful name. You know, it's a, it's an old name. It's, it's on actually a a brand of Orzo that they have. (laughs) So it's, it's definitely a perfectly legitimate name, but you put that in there and you don't get to argue with the reader. The reader's going to say, Hey, that, that word doesn't belong. There was no one, there was no Melissa's walking around. Even if there were, you have to know that. And by the same token, you have to walk that tightrope and develop that muscle to know who to listen to and who not to, and to know that this is going to be your book and your story. And if somebody does put it down because they don't like that you use a certain term or that you don't use enough jargon, you have to live with that. But you're going to first and foremost make it your story. And sometimes you need to maybe show that 20% of research in one section and make up for it elsewhere. Right. How did you develop that? How did you decide exactly what your muscle was going to be when you're writing fiction to get it? Because, you know, Nathaniel could still be sitting in your in your kitchen waiting and <laughs> demanding that you that you get him out there. And you're he, he was pushing you. So how did you do it? How did you decide? side where you ignore the editor, put it aside, ignore the critics and get that just right. It's a thousand decisions. It's not just one. You know, I had early readers who were historians who looked at some of my battle scenes to make sure that I had them described correctly. I had a gentleman, a friend of mine, John Millar, who is great with regard to 18th century seafaring ships and battles. And he read through that particular scene to make sure I was getting that correct. So I did have some sounding boards that really helped me determine if I was doing things well. And then, of course, I worked with editors who also suggested things from a story perspective. Are things moving forward or are they not? And that's always a constant decision when you're talking about fiction, because even the historians are like, well, this sounds fictional. Of course it's fictional. It's historical (laughs) fiction. That's what it is. You have to have strange consequences of characters running into each other on multiple occasions or tying details 75% of the way through back to something that was in the very beginning. There's a thousand decisions on, on what to put in and what to leave out. But ultimately, for me, I guess the decision was constantly about whether or not this is a book that, if it's going to be factual fiction, would make me feel as if I lived in 1776? Would I really fully understand the details, the clothing, the food, the geography, the people, the ideas, the ideals, the consequences, all of that? It was, like I said, a thousand little decisions on what to put in and what to leave out, because ultimately you can't have the book be 400,000 words. It has to be something manageable and readable. 
So it was constantly saying, you know, I, I love these characters and I want to deepen them or I want them to engage more, but is that really propelling the, the story forward so that we get to my ultimate point for the reader at the end? You're enjoying my conversation with Karen A. Chase, author of Carrying Independence, a founding documents novel. She was just talking about those 1,000 choices. She has a very high batting average in this one reader's opinion. So I hope you'll pick up the book and see if you agree. I think you will. You can also visit her at KarenAChase.com and find her on social media where she found me at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Mark Leapson, historian and author of What So Proudly We Hailed, says that carrying independence, quote, vividly invokes what it was like to be in the trenches of the Revolutionary War in a way that few, if any, historians have done. Karen, I want to let that really high compliment for your book hang in the air for a second okay. because it's, <laughs> I bet you love it. It's a sterling review. You should be proud of it. I am, mm -hmm. especially because I know Mark as well. He was one of the guys I talked to early on. And so getting that kind of a compliment from someone who saw me working on it means a tremendous amount. And it's something that is so easy to forget. We romanticize the past, especially the American Revolution. And you mentioned that a few times already, which is so important to give that bite of realism to your story. There is a real war going on. There are horrors happening. He mentions the trenches. We associate that with the Great War, and we think of all those horrors. But Somehow we forget the prison ships. We forget many of the things because this is not 100 years ago. This is 200 and 220 years ago. It's a long time ago. So we don't think of it as being something that people really suffered. It seems very quaint. People were in powdered wigs. What we have are, are paintings where, of course, they wanted to make everything look nice. You weren't going to see smallpox scars <laughs> on people. You weren't going to see Washington having no teeth. Everything, everyone wanted to look good. It was kind of like today, I guess. Everyone's life on social media is not what it really was. So <laughs> the, the painting, commissioning a painting was the social media of the day. That was your Instagram post. Only you were only going to maybe get one in your life. So you better have a good painting if you were lucky. Right. That brings me to my question about designing Nathaniel Martin. You could have made him an idealistic patriot. I know you named him, I believe, after one of those ancestors you mentioned that fought in the revolution, right? His first name? Right. One of my patriots is Nathan Chase. So he could have been somebody who you really do idealize. Hey, we all love to have a famous ancestor, right? Or somebody who did a great thing or fought in a great cause, whose only choices were black and white. They never had a doubt. He, he's riding all that way on the horse. It would be easy to say, oh, he never had a sore behind. He had a great behind. He was my <laughs> ancestor. But you don't do that. Instead, carrying independence, it shows us just how complicated the rebellion turned everyone's life. It wasn't black and white. New Jersey, for instance, changed sides many times as the armies rampaged across it. Washington himself expresses frustration about that. He says that we, we can't decide where they stand. We come into town, they cheer us. The British come into town, they cheer them. And people are just trying to protect themselves and see. And a lot of people want to just kick in on the winning side and come in at the kill and say, oh yeah, I was always for the cause. How did you go about fleshing out those secondary characters you mentioned in this post riders world so that you could get to that idea that it wasn't all just the British, just the Americans. You have Native Americans in there. You also have women in there, which are often left out of the story. How did you go about developing those characters once you knew you had Nathaniel already sitting on your couch? Well, it goes back to a statistic that I read early on, which was the nation was divided by thirds. And, and I use the term nation loosely because we were not, we were a collection of colonies, but the populace was divided by thirds. A third was for revolution and for a variety of reasons. A third was against and for a variety of reasons. And a third was really on the fence. Wait a minute, we're going to fight who? And they have the largest what? They have the largest army. They have the largest <laughs> navy. We're, you've got to be kidding me. But there was also within that last third, people like within Nathaniel's family, his mother is English, his father is German, and an artisan who doesn't really believe in war. And so we see the conflict within that third. That was the more interesting position for me. 
the other thing, in addition to that third, that I really, it was a question that kept arising and I kept coming back to, which was, are the ideals of independence and freedom different for everyone or is it the same? With that question, a girlfriend of mine posed it to me at the one point when I was telling her about this gentleman asking me if I was going to be writing the women's perspective. And my girlfriend said, what does gender have to do with independence or freedom? It has nothing to do with that. Gender doesn't. Nationality doesn't. Geography doesn't. Who you're born to doesn't. And so if I kept that little nugget in mind every time that the ideals of independence and freedom are different for everyone, then... Can I also show that they are all moving toward the same end goal of independence and freedom? So it's both different and the same. And each of my fictional characters, and I think I counted the other day, there are 22 different fictional characters in the book, really four or five that you mainly follow. If I follow a Shawnee character and an 18th century revolutionary soldier and a gentleman who doesn't want to fight like Nathaniel, and a woman who's left alone in Philadelphia, and someone who's working both sides of the war, my antagonist, Silas, are they all working for independence of some kind? Are they all searching for their own freedom? And if so, isn't that what this document was about? And it all comes back to the document, which is also one of my characters, essentially. The document itself was something that I wanted people to learn about, and I want them to pick up and read it anew as if they haven't seen it before. Certainly not like we did in school, where it's just a bunch of ideals in parchment and ink. And being brought to life, just like a human character would be, by the signatures. That's something that kept coming across to me, and now I'm hearing you tell me how you designed it that way, how each signature raises the value of the document and the importance of it. So I like that part of it. (laughs) Yeah, that document, it ultimately is what I hope people read and absorb and re-examine I had to learn quite a bit about the document, the background and the intent from it as well. And there is a a chapter that most of my early readers seem to really enjoy in which George Wythe is describing the actual wording of the document. Where they hacked it up and Jefferson complains, right? What does he describe it as? Something like the death of a thousand cuts, right? They're editing it and going feverishly over it. And as you just talked about experiencing editing and oh, yeah. it sounds like he, he would not have been as open to being edited as you were. He had 55 <laughs> of them. Imagine. <laughs> no. And, and that wasn't as easy as backspacing and track your changes in word. He had to write those out by hand. Right. Yes. I asked novelists to read a section of their book for listeners. This not only gives us a flavor of your writing, but what you choose, just like that 100%, 10% breakdown there, 90%, 10% for your research, what you choose tells us something about your perspective as an author, what you think is important, what you're proud of. You mentioned that chapter right there that people seem to really, really applaud. So set this passage up for us and have at it. Give us a taste here of carrying independence. Sure, Dean. I'm happy to. In this particular scene, Nathaniel has arrived in Williamsburg. It is the scene I was talking about in which George Wythe is talking about the document with him. There was discrepancy about whether or not he was in Williamsburg or Philadelphia when he signed it. And ultimately, I chose to have Nathaniel come to Williamsburg. And George Wythe was Thomas Jefferson's professor at William and Mary. And so rather than having Thomas Jefferson describe the document, I thought it would be a lot more interesting for readers to have George Wythe describe how he taught Thomas Jefferson. But in getting to Williamsburg, Nathaniel has captured a young spy named John who has refused to eat. And now that he's in Williamsburg with George Wythe, John has finally been fed and is locked in a room upstairs. And George Wythe and Nathaniel are alone discussing the specific wording of the Declaration of Independence. The last name is W-Y-T-H-E. Wythe pointed to the statement, all men are created equal. That wording, he said, is from Euripides, the Greek playwright. But together, all of it, well, it reads like T.J. Thomas Jefferson, Nathaniel asked through a laugh. He was a gifted student with remained bent over the parchment. I taught him about Locke, who said we must uphold the very truth that man has rights to life, liberty, and property. You can see it here within the second section, the statement of beliefs. And Mr. Jefferson has also changed the word property to the pursuit of happiness. To some, Nathaniel said, property is happiness. He was thinking in particular about his own brother, Peter. Not within our ideal, with turn to face Nathaniel. Consider this. 
Were you happy when you ate on your journey to Williamsburg, but the young spy John did not? Or were you happier tonight when you ate after he had finally eaten? Easily, Nathaniel admitted to the latter. Happiness is not acquired, Mr. Myrtle. It is not taken, but given, spread, cultivated. Mr. Jefferson uses the word happiness for he sees it not as a reward. It is a duty, with emphasize the last word with his fist. It is a debt of service, a promise to make life better, not just for oneself, but for everyone. Perspective is another thing that you get from reading your novel and from reading a good novel. So there you go. You're taking a step back. And as much as you might have wanted, if you were just going to give in to the inner history nerd, to Mm -hmm. having Thomas Jefferson sit there and speak, you go another step because it's better for this story. You go a step away from him and you have somebody commenting on it and you enjoyed that anyway. But I just wanted to note there that rather than just saying, I'm going to put words in Jefferson's mouth, which I'm sure would be intimidating for an author really? anyway. Yeah. You, yeah. You say, well, hey, I'll take a step back and somebody who knows him, somebody who can refer to him and bring him down off of that platform that he stands on, bring his statue down off of that. This is a guy that just knows him, that's talking about him and breaking down his writing. We were talking about Mark Leapson talking to you about your writing. So what a great way to give us that exposition and do the heavy lifting, do more than just one thing. I always say that a word or a phrase or a line of dialogue can do so many things. Why, when you walk into a room, for instance, or you, if you're doing stand-up and you go out there, you don't just say, how are you doing? You can enter that a million ways. In fact, there was a comic, I can't remember who, I want to say Steve Martin, he said, that's the worst opening that's your big moment when you come out you can you could say nothing like andy kaufman would do you could start complaining about something you could set up a joke you could say any number of things you could say hello cleveland if you're in cleveland (laughs) and you could say hello cleveland if you're in detroit maybe and then when they tell you you're not in cleveland you could say oh thank god i'm not in cleveland you could do any number of, of things when you step out on that stage And that's what you do here. We not only learn about Jefferson from somebody else's perspective, but we're getting background on how the document was written. And I I thought that was a great selection that you made there. I'm glad you chose that. Thank you. Yeah, that setting the stage is really important, obviously, in a book that's fiction. You know, we put a lot of weight into the first line of the book, too. And the first line of Caring Independence is that conditions had changed and not for transient causes. And it's a line that has been in the book right from the beginning at the beginning of the book, and in part because the conditions really had changed for even the smallest of express writers. But the not for transient causes is wording straight out of the declaration. So there's little pieces and parts of that first sentence that mean a lot more for the bigger story. And Caring Independence is the first in your Founding Documents trilogy. You're going to do more than just one book and carry on this story Where will book two take us? And can we hope to meet some of these characters without giving anything away to the listeners who I don't want to spoil their enjoyment of reading Carrying Independence? But how do you go about that? The sophomore novel sometimes can be a curse. Or did it even help you maybe? Because you could trick yourself and say, okay, well, that piece of research I really want to show now, just put it aside. We'll use it for the second book. And you could trick yourself into it. What are you planning for the second and third book? And when will we get them? So the second book I was actually working on first, and it's a founding documents series because this is about the Declaration, the second one is about the Constitution, and the third one will be about the Bill of Rights. And I already had a story idea for the Constitution, and I was working on it when I stumbled across the idea for the book about the Declaration. I thought, well, that's a really brilliant idea to start with the first document and move my way through instead. So the book about the Constitution will stop before the Bill of Rights and really solely talk about some of those last years of the war, kind of 78, 79. It'll take us into the Southern campaigns instead of the Northern campaigns, like this one does. And a lot more of the breakdown, hopefully, again, the breakdown of what the meaning was behind the Constitution and what we can take away from it now personally. You will see some of the characters from hearing independence in that book. I will say they will probably be more like cameos than leads because as much as everybody, I hope, will love Nathaniel as much as I do, and I'd love to spend more time with him, he needs to move out of the house so someone else can come in. (laughs) But the Constitution book has already 
been outlined. About a year and a half ago, I got a fellowship to work at the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester, Massachusetts. And I spent a month working on the outline and the research for that book. So I'm quite a ways into it. And I have more that I'm going to be doing this fall. I have a separate fellowship for a separate book this fall, but this constitution book will be worked on over the next year. Between writing and editing and publishing, Caring Independence took me about 10 years total, or as I often say, two years longer than the war itself. Mm. So hopefully the Constitution book now that writing is going to be my full-time gig going forward, the book about the Constitution will come out sooner. I'm not ready to give away the title or the characters of the plot yet, but that's my founding document series. I also want to let listeners know, since they're going to be celebrating the July 4th weekend right after we're going to air this episode or upload it for people to enjoy. At the end of Caring Independence, you do include that section of reader insights. And speaking of where you're going to put some of that research there, and it's obvious that the facts part is very important to you. You break down the declaration, you give discussion points, your author notes, even the fonts that you use. I mm-hmm. talked about substituting the V's for the U's. You don't do that, but the font gets a mention in there. Typesetters yeah. will be thrilled to see that <laughs> and get a little insight to why you chose that. That's the kind of thing I, I hate to say. That's why it'll take 10 years, right? Because you want to get every little detail right. You have those bonus sections, but you're also somebody that has a marketing background. I do. And that's something that When I came across that detail in your biography, I said, oh, of course, because you sent me the best press packet I've ever gotten from a book. And I'm (laughs) I'm talking, (laughs) I'm not complaining, I'm not criticizing any of the big publishers. But for me, as a book nerd, I I was back as a kid when when they would bring you the books that you'd ordered out of your little pamphlet there. There'd be a bunch of, yeah, you'd get all those books and your Ranger Rick and you'd get your... There was a bunch of Flintstones. They did novelized versions of the Flintstones, which I really liked when I was a kid. Cheap books, but what better way to get kids hooked on reading? You love to get mail back in those days. So I love that. I love your press packet. That was just great. You're in love with your book. That's infectious for readers and hopefully for listeners today. They can hear that I'm really wishing that Nathaniel would come and sit on my couch and maybe he will sometime. Northern New Jersey area, New York City, there's a ton of revolutionary era history. So he's more than welcome to to pass on through. You told me you're kicking him out of your living room. So I'll have him over. But (laughs) since you do have that marketing background, we can benefit from also this side of selling your book, which not everyone's comfortable doing, of just being sincere and telling us why you love it. So make your pitch as we wrap up. Why should readers pick up Carrying Independence and go on this ride with Nathaniel, Kalawi, Susanna, Silas, your other cast of characters, and meet some of the founders of the revolution? Yeah, it's funny. I am a shameless promoter, and I know I am. And I, I think that comes in part because I am such a big lover of history, because I think history really shows us our humanity, where we've been, and how much we can be better in most cases than where we are even right now. And so in picking up caring independence, I really hope with the different characters that I have in there, Nathaniel and Kalawi and Silas and Arthur and the whole cast of them, that the readers see themselves in those people, that they say, my life is not black and white. And the next time that it comes time for me to vote, I understand that it may not be self-evident about who to go for, but participating, acting by pen, by voice, those things are really important. It's what the country's founded on. And to take very seriously the freedoms that we have that so many people, including many that are in the book, sacrifice their lives and their fortunes for. That's really ultimately what I hope people will say Yeah, that Declaration of Independence, it still matters as much as the Constitution. Well, Karen A. Chase, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for sending me that great press packet, that box. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. This has been just so fun, finally being able to talk about the history in the book. Well, your book inspires, it teaches, entertains, all those great verbs. And there's no better time than Independence Day to pick it up 
encourage listeners to climb on that horse with Nathaniel Martin. And you have all those things at the end of the book there. So if you have a young person and you want to bring them up knowing about, or maybe you just don't know, or maybe you're like me and you have a spouse that's from another country and you want to explain to them why it's so important and get some details, there's no better book than Carrying Independence. Thank you. And if you are at any of the live readings of the Declaration of Independence, I will be at many of them this July 4th. Great. You know what? I will post a link on this page at historyauthor.com where people can find some of those. That's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. They're all over the country. Williamsburg, Richmond, Philadelphia, New York. There's going to be a bunch of them in early July. Well, I will look forward to running into you, hopefully, at one of them. But if I don't, I will still have the book. That's the best part, really, of this Independence Day for me is being able to talk with you about this. I hope people will check it out. Thank you so much, Dean. I greatly appreciate it. Again, the book is Carrying Independence, a founding documents novel. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com. And we do hope you will click through there, or even navigate via the Amazon banner at the top of our homepage the next time you purchase anything from Amazon. You go to historyauthor.com, that banner takes you through to Amazon, and Amazon.com gives us a small portion of every dollar you spend at no additional charge in your shopping cart. For just those few extra taps of your finger, you can help us keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like usual. My George Washington size thanks to Karen A. Chase for joining us and sharing her factual fiction view of the journey to fill the Declaration of Independence with the signatures that put teeth in that snake on the yellow Gadsden flag, the one that declared, don't tread on me. Find our guest at KarenHase.com or on social media at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I can testify she's active on all three of those. And while you're at it, let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean, on Instagram at The History Author Show, or our Facebook page. That's it for this installment of The History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for our next all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio. And remember to check out the written interviews that we're posting pretty much every other Monday now. Well, until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us, and happy Independence Day. The boys won the war and came home from the fight. The last night on Broadway was almost his night. But ever since then, it's a different street. Gone are the places where the gang used to meet. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.